Ladies and gentlemen, the Mouthcast. Every day when I open my eyes, now it feels like a Saturday. Taking down from the shelf all the parts of myself that are packed away. It's love with the joy in my heart. Trudging around stony eyed through the town like a living dead now. David Gray, welcome to the Mouthcast. Hello there. How are you, sir? Very good, thanks, Steve. How are you doing? I'm very well. We just played in with a bit of Back in the World, which is from your new album, Mutineers, which I've been listening to for a couple of weeks now. It's a record which is recognisably you, but which has quite a different feel to your last couple of albums. There's a real sense of creative uh, rebirth about it. That's right, yeah, that's exactly how it feels to me too. And that's, I think, beyond creative, I think it's a sort of more general rebirth. It was quite an undertaking, this record. It wasn't a standard album in the studio. This was something more. I just got to the point where I think I was a bit battered from a lot of touring and what have you on the previous couple of albums. They didn't do so well here, but I went around America countless times and came back and it's just that sort of... I, I, I sat down at the piano. I don't want to write some sort of weird, jaded, sort of middle-aged sort of whine. I want to be saying hallelujah, you know what I mean? I want to plug back into the moment. It's mm. the joy of being, the joy of making, but how do I get back there? You know, and I, I, I knew I needed to find somebody to help me and I needed a new start, so... It was about finding the right person and putting a lot of effort in with the writing as well to try and find new ways to get to the good stuff. So what I went through was a kind of scary rehumanizing process where I had to sort of let go, relinquish control, things that are very difficult for me in a creative sense, well, probably in every sense, really. All this stuff was time consuming, but worth the endeavor in the studio. But that's why I think when the music came together, it was more than the sum of its parts. And what you hear on the record is the moment of capture, the moment of discovery. And there's an extra crackle of excitement because you can slave away at the rock face, the creative rock face, with an earnest expression on your face, trying to prove your worth. But it doesn't count for a damn, really. It's joy that's the convincer. When you get that back in your system and you're really singing, then things start to happen. So I'm hoping I'm going to kick a few doors open again with this one. It feels like the beginning of a new era for me, and I'm very proud of the record we've made. Yeah. You'd reached a fork in the road, in a way, then, and one of the forks was a dead end, as you say. So was that a case of uh, being bored with the public idea of you as, you know, wobbly head guy? (laughs) (laughs) I still wobble my head. I can't get away from that. Um... So you've deliberately put yourself outside of your comfort zone, for an established artist, that's a, a really brave thing to do. That was more for my, re- my own reasons. There wasn't any thought of what everyone else might be thinking or wanting. It was more just I needed to move on like an animal in the desert, suddenly craving a mineral. I began to need to find something else. And I, I'd had this feeling it had been building. And when I got back off the road and started writing, I felt it more keenly than ever. I'm like, I'm at the end of something, and that's what I was saying to my friends. I'm at the end of myself, but I feel like I'm at the end of me. You know, I I need to sort of step off. So Mutineers is particularly apt, because I was the captain of the ship, but also the mutinous crew. I had to throw myself overboard to get it made. Well, the songs on Mutineers sometimes feel impressionistic, for want of a better word. Gulls, for instance, uh, and almost like they were nudged into existence rather than chiselled out from really well-honed demos. I did a a very well-honed demo, funnily enough, for that one song, but most of the songs weren't demoed, or if they were, they were so profoundly altered by the making of the record with Andy that they became quite different. Gulls was born in someone else's work, and this is one of the ways I tried to change my process in order that something else might happen. So I, I read a short poem by a Belgian poet called Herman de Conning, just as this island belongs to the gulls. And 
it's so simple. But basically, it's, that's what you hear as the first four lines of my song, slightly edited down to get the rhythm right. So I began with somebody else's work and worked backwards into writing a melody and then fleshed it out with all these vocal parts. But it was born in someone else's work. So this, oh, it was that longing to be free of the human taint and in some other far-flung place, listening to the inhuman cry. That sense of longing and yearning, I think it's sort of always in me. Like, it's not a day goes by. A part of me doesn't hanker to be out on some far-flung headland somewhere, walking in the fresh air. It's something to do with how it feels to be alive in our oversaturated culture. I think mm. it's probably not uncommon. So that's manifest now in the music. It's almost mantric, a lot of the music on the record. It repeats round simple ideas, and the music expands the concept rather than the narrative of songwriting. And it's one of the themes of the record. There's a theme of sort of returning to the moment and being very present, but there's also running counter and somehow in harmony with it, this theme of sort of removal and distance. And um, That's what happened with the girls thing. I, when I wrote the lines, basically the first four lines of the song, this land belongs to the gulls, and the gulls to their cry, and their cry to the wind, and the wind belongs to no one. Good start. That's all somebody else's work. So I, I took that on. I gave my breath to the song, to the song wasn't mine, neither of ship nor of sea, neither of glass nor of wine. Now when I wrote those lines, I really started paying attention, because I was working in abstractions. I was free of literal meaning. There was a ring of truth there. That's what I'd been looking for on a very fundamental level, to be out somewhere where I didn't know what the fuck was going on. So something new, but it felt right. This land belongs to the ghost And the ghost to the cry And the cry So that idea then of working in abstracts, was that because you felt that the way that the process had worked for you before that had become formulaic or restrictive? Well, I, I don't think either of those things is accurate enough for me to say yes. I, I have a certain means of working. My working process would normally start with the chord sequence and I sense a rhythm in it and I respond with a melody, a vocal melody. And then when I feel that like the chord sequence needs to move on, I'll try and find somewhere for it to go. And then you've got a song on your hands. This was working from the page back into the music. And it sounds like an unimpressive thing to do. It's not that it's impressive or otherwise. It's just in going backwards like that, it disabled my sense of taste. So I found I was working on things instinctively, but not knowing whether I liked them or not. I couldn't tell if it was any good. So when I worked on goals all day long, it was only at seven o'clock at night when I'd press play and I'd layered all the vocals up. I thought, Jesus, I've got something here. But all through the making of it, I hadn't really had a clue what I was doing because I was out of my comfort zone. I was just looking. But when you're reaching in a void, often a much more interesting and revealing thing takes place. And that's a theme that ran through the whole process of first writing and then recording the record, because Andy kept the pressure on in that way. When we were in the studio, he forced me into all kinds of shapes that I wouldn't ordinarily have got into. I found myself with the floor cut out, working on songs where he'd taken the verse out and the chorus, and all we had left was a chord sequence. And then we ended up, two days later, we ended up with mutineers. He sort of forced me in ways that weren't comfortable at all and where I didn't really know what I was doing. But in reaching out, I found something more interesting. I imagine in studio terms and in songwriting terms, alongside producer Andy Barlow, this was probably a really exciting way for you to work. Everything quite open-ended, you know, nothing off limits, everything possible. He really took the sound on. That was the key thing. He could translate my vague, abstract longings into something that actually sounded like something other. You know, he made it into something concrete. So as an interpreter of my gut feeling about where I might want the track to go, but also off his own back, he'd create a soundscape. He got so into some of the tracks, you know, he threw himself into them. So he was giving himself to it completely, and we created something that was more than the sum of its parts. It's not something I could have done without him or vice versa. 
And after he'd won my trust with a couple of key things, beautiful agony and mutineers, then I began to see, that we've really got something here. This record's going to really have something. Whatever it is, it's, it, it took its toll. It wasn't easy. There was a lot of stress and strain and argument. Like I say, you have to win someone's trust and to let someone in with a wrecking ball into what you do. It's quite a nerve-wracking thing. You have to sort of relinquish control. And I believe in it, and it's not something I've done before. And just to be seeing new sonic vistas sweeping before me where I'd only been seeing dead ends a year or two before was exhilarating in the extreme. Because obviously I had not been seeing them for a while, and I'd been laboring away. And suddenly it was like you're crowning the hill, and you can really see where you're going. All that excitement and energy fed into the music. And it's, it's in me now, as you can hear. It's, I'm a changed person coming out the other side of it. It was a very profound transformation that took place. Friday night, I'm going nowhere. All the lights are changing, green and red. Talking about transformation, there's this idea that before the single Babylon, you were grafting away and on the verge of packing it in, and then that song came along and opened everything out for you. It still gets a lot of radio play, and the album White Ladder was incredibly successful for you, ubiquitous, really. So you must have used that as a flag in the sand, if you like, a point from which you were able to measure how far you'd come. But did it eventually become something that you wanted to run from? Yeah, I'd never say I'd wanted to run from it per se, although it posed problems. I wasn't expecting to be so successful, but suddenly everything has to be compared to this thing. You become a mainstream artist, so unless you're now selling millions of copies, it's just not good enough. You know, it changed the game in all kinds of ways that I found difficult to deal with. I was wanting to get back to my muse and following the path to where I knew I needed to be going as a musician. But it was an obstacle sometimes to that, you know. And I think one of the problems with fame and success on that level is it's a sort of hall of mirrors. And you end up much more self-conscious than is healthy. You're sort of aware of what you think other people think of you and your, your music and your attitude becomes a little reactive. Well, all those things, they're the barriers of art. As far as I'm concerned, some people seem to turn it into a virtue, a la Radiohead, a sort of weird sort of paranoia kind of thing. that They turn into something driving and positive, but that's just not what powers my music. Yes, it was, it was quite a thing that happened, and obviously, depending who you're speaking to, it's always there as a sort of point of comparison. So it posed its own challenges. So it was something I needed to get beyond, but quite how to get beyond it, I didn't know. And, but now I suddenly realize I am, because I'm back in the moment. And making this record and being inside this music and playing it with my band has sort of vaporized the last shreds of doubt or self-justification that seem to be hung over from that. That's why I think it's the end of an era. I'm now at the start of something else. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the song Last Summer from Mutineers. It has a mesmerising quality about it. It's really gentle, almost oriental motif. Yeah. yeah. But there's this second section, an instrumental section, which is just beautiful. It took me somewhere else, really. Oh, reminiscent yeah. of Vaughan Williams, the Lark Ascending. Oh, I mate, I love that. You just made the hair stand up on the back of my arms now. Lark Ascending is the perfect piece of music. Caroline is astonishing as a cellist. I'm remembering when we were recording it, it was so exciting. And we were just running out of time. It was the classic thing. I've got to go in 15 minutes. It's like, come on, we've got to, fin- <laughs> <laughs> we've got to finish the track. <laughs> it, yeah, I, I love that little song. And there's, it, it's come out very, very special. So hats off to Caroline. However many million hours of practice somebody like that has to put in so that she can nail it. We were looking for how to take the cello on, and we had all these different parts. So it was like, I said, no, they really need to sing. And I started to sing the melody. And she said, oh, I like that, Dave, I like that. And I said, oh, now this is the next line. And within 15 minutes, we'd done it, and she absolutely nailed it. And it, it, it's where the music takes over and speaks even more to the heart than the words and the song have done. Well, that track feels like a centre point on an album of centre points, really. It's a fantastic record. And it's clear it's reinvigorated you. So will you be working this way again in the future? Until I feel that this in itself has become a formula and I need to look at other things, not other ways. 
But yes, I feel like I found a creative ally in Andy. It wasn't an easy record to make. We were at loggerheads at times. But um, I feel that now we've got this relationship, I feel that there's so much more to come. So definitely want to take it further next time. So what is next for you, David? You're a prolific writer, so I would guess you're brimful of ideas. Yeah, well, I've, I've actually got a huge amount of songs left over. I mean, because he didn't want to work on most of the ones I'd written. I've got about 40 pieces of music finished that are just sitting there. So I feel like they're burning a hole in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've got to do something with them. God knows when I'm going to do that. But no, I want to just carry this line of inquiry on further. But at first, I've got to go out to tour this record. It feels like I should do just to it and I hope I'm in for a long ride Thanks very much for your time David a Pleasure And uh, I'm actually going to play us out with a bit of Last Summer Good man, get in there <laughs> Baby Make like we did last summer 